Well, hello there. Thank you for joining me for this week's edition of Telil 24-7. I'm your host, Adam Cook. Many of our items this week come from the town of Port Hawkesbury. For example, we'll give you an update on discussions between the town and the provincial government about whether the current three-lane alignment on Reeves Street is going to continue. You're also going to hear how a recent fire at Port Hawkesbury's Public Works garage is impacting residents of the town who depend on public works for everything from solid waste to snow removal. Later on in the program, we'll give you a perspective on the recent consolidation motions put forward by the town and county of Antigonish to become one municipal unit. And we'll pay a special tribute to Rilla McLean, a Port Hawkesbury resident whose impact on the community extends far beyond the town limits. But we begin with a special interview with the newest president for the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities. That's the province-wide lobby group for municipal units, large and small. The new president is someone that you all know very well. She's the mayor of Port Hawkesbury, Brenda Chisholm Beaton. She took on her position November the 3rd, and Jake Boudreau of The Reporter joined forces with us here at Tell Hill 24-7 to conduct a joint interview with Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton earlier this week. Here's that interview right now. And we're speaking this morning with the new president of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities. She is the mayor of Port Hawkesbury, Brenda Chisholm Beaton. First of all, Brenda, congratulations. How did you feel when it became clear that you were going to have this position? Well, certainly uh, a wonderful feeling um, having the opportunity uh, to take the, the top spot at NSFM uh, with our NSFM executive board. Um, so I guess just to give uh, a little bit of a leader. Uh, so NSFM is the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities. Um, and we advocate uh, for municipalities uh, all across the Nova Scotia, from shore to shore to shore. Um, so it is a big responsibility. And I guess uh, there, of course, um, this position, like all positions at the executive board level, are elected positions. Um, so there was a deadline for folks to put forward a nomination uh, to run um, for either the vice uh, president or the president uh, position. Um, so it was uh, apparent as of, I think, October 21st was the deadline. Um, at that point in time, no other uh, nominations came forward, which essentially put me in a position to be acclaimed. Uh, so um, certainly I, I am very grateful uh, that the, the membership uh, across all of our municipalities have confidence in me to lead this year. Just quickly, Brenda, a follow-up. Who nominated you, do you know? Uh, well, there is a, kind of a built-in process where um, we do have typically the vice president kind of, it's kind of a given that they are going to uh, be nominated for the, the eventual president position. Um, not that that certainly doesn't mean that we don't take other nominations from the the wider membership um but what has been the typical process is that when anybody is stepping into that vp role um there is a general understanding that they're essentially preparing uh, to take on the president's seat so it's kind of a, a great year um i know the the year that just this past year i served as a vp um which put me in a position to um, be privy to a lot of the conversations that were occurring between our, our, uh, our just most recent outgoing uh, president, uh, Mayor Amanda McDougall, uh, the mayor of CBRM, um, and what's happening with the province. So like we work closely with the province to, to make sure that we're dealing with all of the relevant uh, issues and opportunities uh, for municipalities at the provincial level. Um, so really that VP role um, and at times I would step in uh, for for the the past president uh, and help out with chairing meetings so at the end of the day um, the there is a nomination committee that is formed uh, at the executive board level and all of the um, applications or nominations uh, at, that are received at the, the deadline are, are reviewed and that nominations committee made up of the executive board uh, move forward the, the nominations to be considered for our um, AGM or an, annual general meeting of the NSFM. 
Brenda, is there any uh, issues that you have on your agenda, I guess, that uh, might be of particular relevance to here in, in this neck of the woods that you guys are, are looking at? Absolutely. So, um, again, I guess when I talk about um, the NSFM executive board um, and the work that we do with regard to advocacy, um, we do have a current kind of a, a structural um, I guess, uh, basis for which we do that work. And interestingly enough, and, and, and Jake, if you want, you can kind of put a pin in this and then we can go back to it. Um, we're currently looking at a uh, structural change, if you will, that allows us to, to be a little bit more nim nimble and flexible um, to be able to pursue lots of other um, opportunities or, or issues, you know, that, you know, like quickly, because sometimes all of a sudden, um, you know, something outside the mandate that we set um, as, a, as an NSFM board kind of comes into play. So we want to make sure that our structure is uh, just as nimble to be able to roll with the punches in that way. But um, under our current uh, structure, um, typically what we do uh, is we have a, a resolutions process where we ask all of our our, our members, our, our members, which are all of the councils across the province, whether they're from towns or rural municipalities or regional municipalities, we ask them to kind of uh, move forward some of the, the pressing uh, matters uh, and really opportunities uh, for work that we can do uh, forward. So the last resolutions uh, process would have happened several years ago. And what we are, we set uh, uh, five, specific resolution priorities that that we are pursuing and that that way we're trying to constantly move the needle on each of these files so um, one uh, is removing the cap uh, another one is extended producer responsibility and we've actually made some some movement on on that one um, and then we have municipal funding uh, which is always a, a big uh, issue in I know a lot of municipalities are, are challenge, challenged um, financially and it's important that we're always looking for more uh, opportunities for municipalities to be able to fund new initiatives and how we can you know work with the province to allow for that um, and then we have municipal modernization so as you both know uh, municipalities are bound uh, by the Municipal Government Act, um, and that act in and of itself uh, requires a little bit of modernization. Um, so that's what that file is essentially about. And then, of course, um, roads is a big thing. <laughs> so mm. I know, I know you, you know, certainly um, anybody that has the pulse of the word on the street um constituents from all across the province are, are always concerned about the condition of roads um, and it's a little bit of a, a very playing field in terms of roads um, so some some municipal some muni municipalities towns specifically are responsible for um, the the underground and above ground infrastructure um, and some rurals depend on provincial funding uh, for roads um, so that particular file kind of looks at you know, how do we create uh, a more enabling uh, system for which to deal with roads? So these these five were up until this most recent AGM were kind of our main uh, focus. Um, and of course, trying to do some other work, uh, you know, as as things became um, apparent uh, and important to our members. Um, so because EPR uh, is is something that we've we've seen a lot of mobility on and is kind of you know we're satisfying a lot of the objectives that we set for that particular file. Um, we're now looking at adding another um, resolution to focus on and that's sustainability and infrastructure funding. Um, so again, although it's kind of tied to that um, municipal funding uh, piece, as a standalone, uh, what we're hoping to be able to achieve with this particular uh, resolution is to be able to um, look at dedicated staff resources um, at the NSFM uh, staffing level, be able to help some municipalities that may not have the capacity to learn about 
um, be able to uh, pull together a funding application and actually go after some funding streams, uh, you know, for any kind of opportunity around uh, municipal sustainability and uh, infrastructure funding. So there are some smaller municipalities that just don't have that staff resource. So this is something that we're hoping to be able to kind of bridge uh, uh, that gap at the NSFM level. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of the short and skinny of, of what our, our key objectives are at this point in time. Okay. Brenda, I wanted to ask, what do you feel is the relationship now between the NSFM and the provincial government, specifically uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing and the Minister John Lohr? Obviously, you're just coming into your president's position, but what's your sense of how that communication is going between municipalities and the province right now? Right. Um, so I would say if you were to tap the shoulder of any of our NSFM executive board members um, and ask them that question or any of our members uh, from shore to shore to shore, I think we all understand the critical importance of building a relationship with the province, um, certainly on many, many fronts. Um, and we all wish that uh, the relationship was stronger. So part of the mandate for this year is to continue to cultivate and strengthen that that relationship with Minister Lore and uh, and his staff. So luckily, I had the opportunity to talk to Deputy Minister Paula Flesch at the conference. Um, he was there, I think, almost every single day of the conference uh, that was just held in Halifax at the Westin. And uh, he's generously offered to um, have a sit down with me as the incoming president to kind of talk about, you know, what does the next 12 months look like? How do we cultivate a relation, like a really strong relationship together, not only with me as president, but also with our executive board? And we do have several new incoming executive board members, because I mentioned earlier, they're all elected. Uh, positions. So we have mm -hmm. um, rural caucus chair. Um, we have, a, I think, believe a new regional uh, regional municipalities caucus chair and, and some other uh, new members. So at the end of the day, um, I think that meeting will be will be critically important mm -hmm. because it kind of stage. And my message to to Minister Lore and his team will be, um, you know, that that we're ready to roll up our sleeves, like we're not just going to stand idly by and have that expectation that the government is just going to fix everything for us. I think, you know, we need to all be active change agents in, in the process, and make sure that, you know, we're, you know, that 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 message is we're, we're really we're, we're, we're playing ball on the same ball team here you know um, we want to see our entire province grow and thrive and local government is the closest to the everyday lives of the people of Nova Scotia our, our citizens um, and wouldn't that be wonderful if we can cultivate a really super strong relationship with the province so that we are continuing to put ourselves in win-win scenarios so that that's going to be my message to Minister Laura. One of the things you mentioned when you posted about this on social media was how you needed the cooperation of town officials here to be able to accept that position. Uh, you spoke very effusively about the deputy mayor uh, for the past year, Jason O'Coin, and the incoming deputy mayor, Huey McDougall. Can you tell me a little bit about having that give and take with your colleagues here on Port Hawkesbury Town Council in terms of being able to pursue the president's role for the entire province for the NSFM? Uh, absolutely. So um, very early on in this this term, when we were all elected uh, and for some of us re-elected in 2020, um, you know, I, I did have a mind at that time, you know, to continue the work that I was doing at NSFM. I was part of the executive at that at that point in time. And, um, you know, amongst the executive board, um, the, we, we were kind of having discussions about, you know, what are your aspirations on the board and that sort of thing. And I had a lot of uh, great support, you know, kind of other board members tapping me on the shoulder and saying, you know, you would make a really great incoming president at some time. Um, but before I made any kind of promises or any kind of commitments um, at that level, because I do understand this is a very um, time-consuming role, um, if you want to do it the right way, of course. So, 
I knew that it would be a time consuming role. So I did have individual conversations with our council members just to let them know, you know, I am interested. Um, and I like kind of doing the math uh, because there are opportunities each year for that presidency to rotate uh, between the regionals, the rurals and the towns so that we kind of have that broad spectrum of representation. Um, so as for example, as the president, uh, and, and I'm also a sitting mayor of a town, um, it's important for me to not only represent towns, obviously, but also to represent um, the regional municipalities and the rural municipalities, but to make sure that there's a lot of variation. They do rotate that. So doing the math, I knew that this particular year would be my opportunity to step up um, uh, with the towns having the turn for the presidency. Um, so I kind of did the math as well and who would be the deputy mayor at the time. Um, and that uh, was is Huey uh, McDougall, Councillor Huey McDougall. So I did. I kind of pulled him aside to have a conversation, and I explained, you know, this is this is something I would like to do, but only with your support. It's going to be probably um, uh, if it's a lot of work on my end. Chances are um, I'm going to need you to step up and to help fill in uh, when need be uh, in the mayor's chair as deputy. And he was very, very supportive of taking that extra work on um, that will enable me to, to do this, this role that I've taken on. So, and, and of course, and having a very understanding council, um, you know, that is extremely important because I, I don't want our, I want our council to, um, you know, be flexible and not feel like, you know, I, I'm, I'm no longer fulfilling my duties as mayor of the town. And they're all very supportive and they and, and willing to kind of step up and help um, so that we make sure that um, that everything's getting done at the town level, but to allow me to be able to, to take on this uh, provincial level uh, assigned. Also, of course, our CAO, Terry Doyle, is always mm -hmm. extremely um supportive and and also that you know there is there there is a give and take here so like um you know taking on extra responsibility to allow me to do the role but also there's some gifts with regard to having an opportunity to have this uh provincial posting um you know the opportunity to get in the room with some ministers um to cultivate those relationships is going to be important that provincial level, but it's also going to be important um, to the straight region because it's it's an opportunity to you know showcase our region on the provincial uh, stage as well um, and our town. So um, yeah, I feel like there's there's a lot of give, but there's also, also a, a little bit of take there. So that to kind of balance balance that scale the scales and that opportunity. You mentioned the straight, Brenda, and I'm just wondering if you had any response from, for example, uh, your neighboring municipal leaders, Amanda Mumberkett, um, Ron Chisholm, Bonnie Jean McIsaac, if they had anything to say about you? Oh, gosh, they're all so super supportive um, and, you know, and very gracious and, and not just the, the wardens and the mayors, but also um, some councillors from the street and from Cape Breton and Nunamagi have reached out and they're like, I think this is wonderful. And, uh, you know, you're going to do a great job and just very supportive. So it's really nice to see. Last question quickly to the outgoing President Amanda McDougall from CBRM have any advice for you as you were taking her post? Well, I have her phone on speed dial. <laughs> so she's very gracious, um, such a kind uh, and positive leader. Um, so, so she she's definitely um, offered, you know, if there, if I do have any questions at any time, need of advice, that that her her uh, her line is is always open to me. So I mean, that's that's a very uh, generous offer from from a very busy mayor. <laughs> you kind of uh, hit on. Um, you know, the fact that this was going to probably take some time away from uh, your your current duties as mayor, but it's also kind of, I guess, augments or, or adds to what you're you're able to do as mayor too, because you know you're part of a of a provincial body that has some lobbying powers and things like that. So, I, and and I assume also there's going to be some travel entailed and in, 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 in position as well. Absolutely. So this particular post um, would require um, some uh, participation at the FCM level, so the Federation of Canadian mm -hmm. Ministers. Um, so I anticipate that throughout the next 12 months, 
Um, I will be in Ottawa maybe two or three times uh, participating um, as the president of NSFM um, automatically places uh, places me at the FCM board level um, by forfeit of position. Um, so there there is that. And I did mention a little earlier to uh, Jake and Adam that, you know, NSFM is in the process of going through a little bit of a structural change to be able to kind of create a little bit more of an enabling environment um, to be able to do the work that we do and do it well and do it quickly. Um, so I mentioned that we do have those uh, five uh, resolutions, um, but we're ho what we're hoping to do, um, and, and I mentioned earlier that there is a resolution process that kind of pulls councils from all across the province, um, but what we're hoping to do is change that a little bit so that instead of having um, resolutions, um, and in the past we used to have actually um, just a like a, a running list of, of several resolutions, and that's why we boiled it down. Let's just focus on five to try to to make to to let the province know that these are the most uh, the the most important to us. Um, but we're hoping to do um, because we've had. Uh, the challenge with having those just five resolutions is they're big and sometimes hard to 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 move the needle on those um, because they're such big ticket uh, items. Um, sometimes it kind of can make us look like we're not making a lot of progress uh, for the membership. So we're hoping to be able to create a much more nimble structural um, and uh, entity as an SFM so that. Um, we are constantly receiving um, the issues of the day uh, by by councils um, at their council tables. It also, and then that allows us to kind of create a little bit more of a running list of things that we should be focused on without it being too overbearing or cumbersome. Um, and another change um, is with regard to elections and voting. Um, so typically uh, the democracy of NSFM was occurring like through the election process at fall at fall conventions. So you almost you had to be there in order to vote. And not every single councillor or, or warden or mayor is able to attend every single conference. So we're actually pivoting uh, the voting process so that the voting is actually happening at the council table. So it's increasing the democ democracy of NSFM. So um, and and. and the last change I'll just quickly mention is that currently we are um, we have a caucus system um, that represents the the different towns, the rurals, and the regional the sorry the rural regional municipalities and the towns, mm -hmm. and those caucuses. You know, sometimes you have you could have uh, for example we use towns for example so the member the either the councillors or mayors uh, or deputy mayors of the town's caucus, you know, you see that broad membership like sprinkled all throughout the province. Um, so we're looking at doing um, something that I think will be more conducive to the One Nova Scotia uh, movement that focuses on regional collaboration. So instead of having caucuses, we're going to look at having regional um, areas. Um, so that is a mix of, re of rural, regional, and town uh, municipalities so that, you know, as regions, we are voting in representatives um, that that will kind of bring our regional interests to the executive board table, which I think is going to be um, maybe a little bit more effective at the end of the day. Now, you may have heard during that interview that Deputy Mayor of Port Hawkesbury, Huey McDougall, is going to be taking on a larger role than would normally be expected because Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton is going to be the new president of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities. Now, earlier this week, Town Council held its regular monthly meeting at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Centre. I caught up with the new Deputy Mayor, Huey McDougall, after the meeting and asked him what he thought not only about serving in this role for the coming year, but serving in a larger role because of the new duties that the Mayor has. Here's how Deputy Mayor McDougall responded. Uh, it's going to be an interesting uh, year. This is my sixth time as uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, kind of aging myself there. But uh, yeah, the Mayor, our Mayor, was, is fortunate enough to win uh, She's the president of the UNSM this year, so uh, I may be called on to maybe uh, chair more meetings and be more involved in uh, council 
uh, firsthand uh, as the deputy mayor. Uh, so, uh, yeah, like I say, she's the new president, so she's going to be spending a lot of time there. So I'll probably have to step in a little more. But of course, I'm going to be supportive, 100% supportive. We have to be for, for council and for staff and for the mayor when she's not here. If she's doing other business for the province, well, I'm going to step up and uh, represent her as, as uh, best that I can. And like I say, it's not my, not my first rodeo. This is my sixth time as deputy mayor, so I did it before. On October 30th, one night before Halloween, a major fire broke out at the main public works garage serving the town of Port Hawkesbury. Now that impacts everything from solid waste collection to snow removal, as well as basic street repair and road upgrades within the town. And as the CAO of Port Hawkesbury, Terry Doyle, told me after this week's town council meeting, that is going to have an impact on service delivery in the town for the foreseeable future, mainly because insurers for the town haven't yet taken a full look at the public works garage to see exactly what the cost is going to be. So here's how CAO Terry Doyle explained the situation to me following Tuesday's town council session. Yeah, there was significant damage uh, that had occurred to our public works garage. Uh, we're still really determining the cause, so insurance company has sent in a specialist to, to look at where they, where the fire, how the fire started. We know where it started, we know what, uh, some of what the damage uh, that has been done, uh, but we're still waiting for that uh, definitive answer on, on how the fire actually uh, started. Uh, so, so there's significant damage to uh, to heavy equipment uh, to our to our fleet. We had two two service vehicles uh, that were involved in the fire, uh, as well as uh, our our parts, our emergency repair clamps, our uh, most of our equipment uh, was in that facility, and, and uh, most of it is unusable at this point in time. So significant. Uh, damage to the building and and our inventory and our equipment. Our first uh, priority was to get temporary uh, accommodations and, and put temporary uh, measures in place to ensure that uh, that Port Hawkesbury Public Works continues to operate. So they moved into temporary accommodations uh, sort of th within a, within a couple of days. Uh, we started ordering emergency uh, repair materials and equipment. Um, we've, we're putting in place temporary uh, sort of longer term accommodations f for them. Uh, but Public Works do, do all of the things that Public Works will do on a, in, in any kind of a town. So we maintain our roads, uh, emergency repairs to water mains, uh, to sewers, sewer backups. Uh, there, there's many, many, many items that are and requirements that that lay within their within their mandate. So, very much an operational unit, uh, very much needed to to maintain the health and safety of the residents of the town of Port Hawkesbury. Yeah. So there's still a number of constraints. We certainly don't have the number of vehicles that we had. Uh, we don't have an operating backhoe or excavator. Uh, so we're we're working with local contractors to to be able to uh, respond to emergencies, but we're putting measures in place that'll, that'll take us through sort of the longer term as, we, as we're able to reconstruct or, or renovate and, and get back into normal, uh, normal working environment. Uh, but I have to say our staff has been absolutely phenomenal in, in identifying needs and, and going out and getting um, emergency repair type of materials and, and getting up and running almost immediately. So very, very fortunate uh, with, with our staff. They can't say enough about uh, how well they adapt it and, and the uh, thoughtfulness and, uh, and their ability to, to change and adapt has, has been phenomenal. So yeah, my hat is off to Jason McMillan, our manager of engineering and public works and all of our staff at Public Works. Well, we have to let the process unfold. So we've had a fire specialist from insurance um, visit the site. Uh, we've had the adjuster visit the site. We've had a consultant uh, that determines the residual value and the, and the cost to reconstruct visit. Uh, we have another side, which, is, which includes our, our heavy equipment and our vehicles. And so that insurance process is, is coming along. So a, a, lot of, a, a lot of activity occurring, uh, but we're still waiting for some very critical information. 
Recently, at the NSCC Straight Area Campus Auditorium, a special workshop took place that brought together service providers and community organizations from around the Straight Area. These included YREACH, the Richmond County Literacy Network, Cape Breton South Recruiting for Health, the Cape Breton Partnership, and many more. It was the brainchild of the YMCA of Cape Breton, and specifically YMCA of Cape Breton workshop facilitator Dana Pettipaw. You're going to hear from her in just a couple of minutes, but first of all, we wanted to introduce you to the executive director of the Cape Breton YMCA, who kicked off the November 2nd workshop at the NSCC Straight Area Campus. My name is Valerie Dalhanty, and I'm with the YMCA of Cape Breton Employment Services Centre. And uh, we are very excited to have such a good group here today. We are hoping to bring people together um, to talk basically about what it is that we're doing, um, how we're serving the community, and maybe look at some gaps and some strengths that we have and just bring us together so that we can um, better serve our communities. So on our agenda today, um, we're going to, after we do a few little introductions, um, Dana is going to talk about the vision of, uh, this, of the, uh, the, the network. Um, we're going to do some round tables and after we do some round tables we're going to just have some mingling time so that we can talk to each other, pass um, business cards and uh, just, just meet one another and, and develop some relationships. And then we'll look at what are we going to do moving forward. So we'll take a look at is this uh, a forum that works for us? or is there some other way that we need to meet and move this forward. But I think this is really important and I know that um, this used to be, I don't know how many years ago, but this used to be um, a process that we had. There was a network in this area for, um, for uh, uh, agencies that serve people in the various communities in this, in this counties. Um, and so it's good to get back to that. Even like after COVID, you know, get back to being with people um, and sharing ideas, sharing best practices and uh, like I say, you know, helping, helping our communities and uh, serving them better, because we do it better when we do it together. Four to five different meetings that we, um, like organizations that we invited, and um, hopefully we'll kind of grow from there. So if there's anyone that you feel um, is missing that should be here at the network break, there's some questions up here some sticky notes and kind of think about things as we're going through and uh, if anything pops up just put them here and I will analyze it and send it out with the meeting minutes um, at the end hopefully by within a week so um, Valerie had mentioned the the vision of this project so I kind of have been with one services for quite a while with East Nobility and then Island Employment and now very happily with the YMCA of Cape Breton. And in the past we used to have these meetings. We used to come to the boardroom here, and I guess the boardroom is no longer, but we used to come here once a month, once a quarter, I don't even really remember, but it was great to get together and, and really talk to everyone and see, you know, what's happening, where are the gaps with our services, can we work together on like building these initiatives. So that's what we're hoping to do now, so bring that forward. So we really want to kind of empower the local community partners to come together and really collaborate for the benefit of our mutual uh, clients. We also hope to kind of fill those gaps, like I said, and ensure that the services being offered in one area, so say Richmond County, you know, maybe not the exact same, but much the same as being done in Inverness County. So just kind of making sure that there's organizations that are working together and kind of know what's going on. And really being that one main hub to come to. So what I'm, we're hoping to do is kind of create a, a database of sorts with contacts and the services that you offer and you know the regions that you service and then having that one place that you can kind of reach out to me and say, hey, I'm looking for volunteers, can you send out a mass email to the network and see if there's anyone that's interested in helping out. So that's kind of what this is. The other part is kind of a, like a community of practice. So I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with that term, but um, I used to do a lot of peer support uh, work, you know, I guess province-wide really, but out of Halifax. 
and we had a community of practice. So just kind of getting together and brainstorming about issues, how to solve some of our issues. So that's kind of another thing that we're hoping to see come together with this. And you can see kind of around the room is a helping, helping community. So not just you know, focusing on what we do, like helping everyone else, as well as being you know, more innovative because like we were saying, you know, when, <laughs> when Cabot closes, the streets of Inverness you know, close up with it. So what are we gonna do to ensure full-time um, year-round employment for some people? So trying to be innovative and creative to, to make sure that our clients, our mutual clients, are really getting everything that they need. So, and then also I see it as kind of being a, like a knowledge um, stewardship type community. So having that one place where you can go to and say, you know, okay, I have a newcomer uh, that's coming, they have a job in Richmond County, but again, you know, maybe the wife does not have any formal education that would, um, you know, fit in. So finding that education piece, you know, helping with the uh, the doctor shortage and, and nurse practitioners. So really, kind of working together to for the betterment of the entire straight area. Um, so again, and then you know, practicing or establishing best practices, I guess, is is another thing. It's working with each other to see what's working for them that may not be working for you and what could be done that's better and then also any organizations that are missing from the room again there was 45 different organizations invited not everyone could attend today but um, we're hoping that we kind of reached everyone but there may be someone that we're not aware of so please you know put sticky notes here um, put in whatever you'd like and we will kind of analyze it and get it out with the meeting minutes um, when, when that's all done. Even if you don't live in Port Hawkesbury, you probably know all about the Destination Reeve Street project. That's a three-year-old initiative that has seen the number of lanes along Port Hawkesbury's main thoroughfare reduced from four to three, with strategic turning lanes near the entrance and exit points for town businesses and other prominent gathering places. Well, the town conducted a survey of its residents earlier this year to see what they thought of the Reef Street overhaul, and it also enlisted the Provincial Department of Public Works to conduct one more traffic count before a final report on the project comes together. Well, the town was supposed to receive that final report and a presentation from the Public Works Department earlier this fall. That hasn't happened just yet. So I thought I'd ask CAO Terry Doyle exactly where the project stands right now and when Port Hawkesbury officials should be able to hear from people with the Public Works Department of Nova Scotia. Here is CAO Doyle's response. So very much with, uh, with Nova Scotia Public Works, with the engineers, and uh, we're, we're waiting for some information back on, on them. Um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, they're working diligently on this, but, but there's a fair amount of information uh, to put together an analysis as well. So um, that, is, that is moving, uh, but we're, we're waiting for a response from, uh, from the province on that. You had mentioned earlier this fall that the expectation was that the Provincial Department of Public Works was going to make a presentation to Town Council about its findings on Destination Reef Street. Is that still the case? Um, we haven't asked for it first. We'd like to see what the report is. And uh, yes, I, I would assume that will that will be presented by Public Works to Nova Scotia Public Works to Council. I know the town was originally targeting to have that presentation made in November. It's November now. Should we be looking to next month or early in the new year? I definitely think that's that's a, that would be a reasonable expectation. Some of you may be aware that the town and county of Antigonish have each voted to consolidate the two municipal units into one. Votes occurred at both the town and county level just a couple of weeks ago and it came with some controversy and also some concern about the personal safety of the municipal leaders in Antigonish town and county. Well, during our interview with the NSFM's new president, Port Hawkesbury Mayor Brenda Chisholm-Beaton, 
The reporters Jake Boudreau asked a question about whether the consolidation of the town and county of Antigonish would impact the membership of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities and whether that could hurt the organization's bottom line. Here's how Mayor Chisholm Beaton responded. Typically, like our, our membership fee structure, um, it's kind of, there's a little bit of a formula to it, so I don't think that will impact uh, our bottom line at NSFM in any way, shape, or form. So with regard to the um, consolidation, or ta and, and I believe they have actually two successful motions at both councils to move forward with that, that plan. Um, so going back to one of the resolutions that I had mentioned, uh, that's something that we're focused on, uh, refers to municipal modernization. So part of that, um, municipal modernization is about um, looking at the MGA um, and working on, I guess, ways for, you know, municipalities to work uh, better together, like from a shared services perspective, um, you know, how we can work better together regionally. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the end result will be consolidation, but it's certainly um, will lend itself to regional collaboration and cooperation. And at the end of the day, you know, if two or three or more municipalities feel like, you know, you know, we are, we are a strong region from that perspective. And if they did want to talk about um, consolidation, I mean, that, that certainly would be up to the individual uh, municipalities. Um, but it's not, it's not necessarily um, a mandate uh, of NSFM, um, although we have had uh, the opportunity to learn a little bit more about the process at our different conferences. Um, but for uh, probably more of the purview of, of the Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and I know that they are working quite closely with Annie Ganesh Town and, and County just to, to see how that process has been going from, from, a, from a to C. During this week's town council session at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Center, councillors took a moment to recognize the efforts of a community champion and longtime volunteer who passed away last week. Her name is Rilla McLean. She left this world on November the 4th. Huey McDougall, the deputy mayor of Port Hawkesbury, raised her name during the acknowledgments portion of the town council regular meeting at the Civic Center. And afterwards, I decided to ask the Deputy Mayor and Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton what they thought of Rilla McLean's contributions to Port Hawkesbury's Accessibility Committee, but as well as a historian, archivist, and community volunteer. Here's what Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton and Deputy Mayor McDougall had to say. She's been a long-term uh, resident of the town of Port Hawkesbury uh, and, you know, fortunate for the Port Hawkesbury Accessibility Advisory Committee. She was certainly a big voice at that table and, you know, certainly anytime we had to kind of take the temperature of some of the work that we were doing. Um, I know that it, she always had an open door policy. If we had any questions about access or inclusion with regard to the work that we were doing as a committee and to the accessibility plan overall. So um, she certainly was uh, an amazing advocate for accessibility and she will be dearly missed by the town of Port Hawkesbury and certainly by council. She was a fantastic lady. She, she would I would stop and say hello. I used to go down and visit her, and I remember I remember uh, the very first time I ran my election. I had little pins, and she asked me for a pin, and I, I gave her the pin, and she showed me these pins that she had. She had a collection of uh, hundreds of pins, like pins that you'd put on for elections. She even had one there of John F. Kennedy. So I, I was amazed with all the pins she had. And I was seeing her, and I'd see her at the Civic Center quite a bit, and I would stop and talk to her, and she was... Uh, a wonderful lady. For anybody who knew Rilla, you had to lean in close because <laughs> she had just the quietest little voice, such a humble, humble person, um, but her words held weight. Certainly, they did. And we'll brighten the mood a little bit as we wrap up Tell Ill 24-7 this week with another installment of our infamous Fast Five game. I think you might just recognize the person who's taking part this week. Let's have a look. 
And we're pleased to have joining us for her first crack at the Tail Hill 24-7 Fast Five, the Mayor of Port Hawkesbury and the new President of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, Brenda Chisholm Beaton. Mayor Brenda, are you all ready for the Fast Five? I'm as ready as I'm going to be, Adam. <laughs> That's a spirit. All right, here we go. So the first question, these are all very simple, quick and okay. easy questions. Coffee, tea or neither? Oh, both. <laughs> both. You're the first person to say both. Well, I grew up drinking tea, and then I used coffee to survive municipal politics, so I feel like I need to marry both of those just to, yeah, get through the next at least 12 months. Oh, my if goodness. you'll indulge me. <laughs> Spoken like someone who's been in municipal politics for 10 years. Yes, there we go. I got my mind. <laughs> no, you're diverse, and you accept everything, so... Hey. That's, That's great. Yeah, we'll that, go with your answer. <laughs> let's go with that answer. Okay. Next up, uh, I have a week free to binge watch any movie or TV show I want. What is it? Uh, it depends on whether or not my daughter is watching with me because we all know that 16-year-olds are the boss of all households. <laughs> so what is Alexis watching these days? Oh, she, right, she likes any kind of ER show, so oh. we would probably be watching... Um, yeah, any of those. <laughs> so we'll crank up Grey's Anatomy then. Exactly, Grey's Anatomy, yeah. All Thank right. you. Good stuff. Next, dream vacation. Oh, Jamaica. Jamaica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and especially on a night like tonight, much warmer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, Jamaica's slightly warmer than Nova Scotia is right now. Yes, right on. Yeah. All right. You can be any animal for one day. What is that animal? <laughs> oh, God. I would say a cat. My cat's got it pretty good at home. <laughs> you would want to be a Bengal cat so that you're... I would want to be a Bengal cat. Absolutely. And I will tell you, the, our Bengal cat gets all the attention at home. So I would love to be pampered for the day. So would you want the Bengal cat to pamper you then? That's interesting. <laughs> so it'd switch places. There we go. It'd be like Freaky Friday. <laughs> Sounds good. All Sign right. me up. <laughs> That's terrific. And last question, and this might be relevant to your new post as NSFM president. Sure. Would you rather be a forest or a tree? Oh, I would rather be a forest. It seems like way more opportunity being a forest than just a tree. In Port Hawkesbury, where opportunities await, Mayor Brenda would rather be a forest because there's more opportunity. I love it. <laughs> That's great. And there you have it. That wraps up this week's edition of Telil 24-7. Thank you for tuning in, and a big thank you to my interview guests this week, Huey McDougall, Terry Doyle, and Brenda Chisholm Beaton. And special thanks to the editor of the Straight Area Reporter, Jake Boudreau, for collaborating with me on the main interview with Mayor Chisholm Beaton. If you have any thoughts or comments on what you've seen on this week's Tell Ill 24-7, or just some suggestions for future editions of the show, I'd love to hear from you. You can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863, or you can reach me by email using the address adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. You can also contact Halil Community Television directly at the station in Arishat using the phone number 902-226-1928 or use the email address talil at talil.tv. As always, you can follow Talil Community Television on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Our YouTube channel features every single episode of Talil 24-7, including this one, as well as individual interviews and stories from our shows. And you'll also see a lot of other great material produced by Talil Community Television in recent weeks, including several new shows from the newest addition to the Talil news team, Gabrielle Sampson, who is Talil's new French language journalist. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for joining me this week on Talil 24-7. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a brand new show. Bye for now.